We have the privilege this summer of having one of the sons of this church, Josh Harder, as our summer intern. Uh, he's raised in this church. You may not have seen him around certainly as much as before in the last four years because he is a freshly minted, right off the degree page graduate of Wheaton College. And we are happy to have him here this summer, and you have. He was introduced last week. He won't be introduced in coming weeks, but you'll see him regularly up here and this morning as he reads this morning's scripture to us. Uh, this morning, uh, the preaching passage is from Ephesians chapter 2, uh, beginning at verse 4, going through verse 10. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. It is by grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Father, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, last Sunday was an important and beautiful and appreciated day for Pathway Church. Jonathan Jarbo was back in the pulpit at this place, and you learned the name of who, God willing, will be your next pastor, Josh Howith. Uh, as you've already heard, he, I will be here all the Sundays between now and July 17th. I'll be here next Sunday, but Josh Howith will be in the pulpit. Following that, the next Sunday uh, and the Monday following that, the Southern Baptist Convention's annual meeting will be in Anaheim. It's very unusual for it to be in California. It'll be a generation or two before it is there before, and so dignitaries from all over the Baptist world, everyone from the Southern Baptist world, We'll be in California, and on June 12th, following the Sunday Josh is here with us, we will welcome uh, the president of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, one of our six seminaries, uh, Jamie Dew. He's a young man. He's a fairly new president uh, there. I'm looking forward to meeting him so myself. We'll be in this pulpit. Uh, my last Sunday with you will be July 17, and it has been one of the honors of my life to serve you. The service isn't over yet, but I count about six more Sundays, uh, uh, eight Sundays together, but six Sundays in the pulpit, and we have that. I don't think we'll make it through Ephesians, but we'll, we'll give it a tiny bit of a try, but we'll end up wherever we end up uh, during that time together. Being, serving you has been one of the great honors of my life. I look forward to the next eight weeks as well, and uh, I... I plan, you may not plan on this, but I plan for Pathway to be part uh, of my life and Stephanie's life, an important part of it for the rest of uh, my life here on this earth. I love you and have uh, fallen in love with this church. So let's see how far we can get in Ephesians, and certainly today. The last time we were together, we opened the second chapter, and we saw there that it was full of bad news and good news. The bad news is that we are dead in our trespasses and sin, and in death we have no life or power or ability to, to do anything. But then verse 4, with two words, introduced the entire gospel. But God, what we cannot do, God does. Where we are trapped, God frees. Where we are without help, God moves. Then we closed by seeing that all the stories that we love most, the stories of hope and renewal and recreation and new chances and recovered love, all of them point to and depend upon the one great true tale 
the gospel of Christ, the fact that the one who created us is rich and mercy and loves us with an everlasting love and has reversed every defeat and conquered every foe and righted every wrong and broken every bondage. That's the good news. Because of His great love and the richness of His mercy, He makes us alive when we were dead and sits us in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus, though we were beasts, though we are beasts, He loves us and embraces us and dances with us. No one else has ever or will ever love you like that because of His great love, rich in mercy, He makes us alive. From death we are given life and from bondage we are made free. That is the gospel. Now, this week, as chapter 2 continues, Paul tells us the reason for this great act on God's behalf. Jonathan Edwards, certainly the greatest theologian and probably the greatest mind that America has ever produced, wrote an entire difficult book on this subject. It has the title, The Ends for Which God Created the World. And now in one verse, verse 7, Paul gives the answer, it's the same answer, that Jonathan Edwards takes a book to unpack. Paul says, God has done this in order that in the coming ages God might show the incomparable riches of His grace. Show them. We'll catch up with this. This is the point at the end, but let's introduce it now. God wants His church, His people, you and me, if we call Christ Lord, to be His display cases, His showcases, His trophies, in which God can see His glory. He wants us to live in such a way that there's no possible explanation for it other than the grace and glory of God Himself. One of my colleagues at Gateway, he might be here this morning, took a mission trip to Egypt a few years ago, and he said he was looking forward to the laser light display at the Great Pyramids. I've always wanted to see that, haven't you? And he said he went there that night, and it was one of the biggest disappointments of his life. It wasn't grand or glorious, kind of tepid and weak and pathetic. Can you imagine what a laser light display should look like that was is worthy of the glory of those great pyramids? It would put the fireworks display at Disneyland to shame. Or the fireworks displays we'll see lots of places in the next few days. That's what God is calling us to look like. That was really part of Jonathan Jarbo's message last week. He pictures that we should be available for and receptive of and conduits of God's grace. God wants us to make His people a laser light show, fireworks extravagances, trophies displaying His grace. And in order to do this, this is the order of the rest of our text. It is God's grace and faith and works. And that order is important. That's what I want you to walk away with today. Grace, faith, works. Christianity is the only religion I know of. I don't know every one, but I know a lot. And I'd be, I'd be shocked if there's an exception to this. Christianity is the only religion that doesn't wait for its adherents to become acceptable in order to be accepted. The priority of grace in the gospel means that you become accepted by the work of God and then also by His grace you become acceptable. So let's start with grace. It's one of, in one of his books, C.S. Lewis wrote, once upon a time, in our world, there was born in a stable something that was greater than this world. I love that phrase. 
And I want to adapt it this morning to say in the word grace, there is something that is greater than this world. The single word grace is so remarkable because it means something good is done not just for people that don't deserve it, but for people who deserve the absolute opposite. Grace, let's not be deceived, is expensive for the giver. It is shocking to the observer, and it is threatening because it is life-changing to the recipient. Verse 8 tells us, by grace you are saved, not of works. I love the word grace. I love all of the appreciative ripples it has when its various uses in our language. We speak of being grateful for someone's kindness, gratified by someone's good news, grat congratulated when we are successful, and I look forward to congratulating our graduates. Is it next week that we, that we congratulate our graduates? Two weeks. I'm looking forward to that. Gracious when hosting friends. Pleased when we leave a gratuity. I love uh, the phrase grace notes. Those are notes that composers write that are added. They are extravagant. They are gratuitous, if you will, because they're not needed for the melody, but they are what makes the melody thrilling and exciting and beautiful and harmoni har harmonious and, and worth listening to. Sociologists speak of looking glass cells. I've always found this an interesting concept. They say that a person's self-identity is formed by what is thought of them by the person who is most important to them in their life. I don't know whether that's true or not, but it's an interesting thesis to test. If it is true, that means a person's self-identity comes from their mother or father or their mate or maybe even their boss. If it's true, it means that John, the beloved disciple, if you asked him who he was, he would not answer one of the twelve, one of the apostles, the author of one of the great gospels. He would answer, I am the person beloved of Christ. And so the important thing for Christians to, to marinate in, to learn from this text, is that our lives are to start by being marinated by grace. We have never been loved and never will be loved again by a love like this. It is the foundation of all that follows and all that we are and all that our self-identities, we are founded by God's unearned, unmerited, lavish, extravagant grace. Many years ago, Christian counselor David Siemens uh, wrote this. It's a third of a page, but I will quote it at length. Many years ago, this is an experienced Christian counselor, I was driven to the conclusion that the two major causes of most emotional problems are these two. The failure to understand, receive, and live out God's unconditional grace and forgiveness. And the failure to give out that unconditional love, forgiveness, and grace to other people. We read, we hear, we believe a good theology of grace, but that's not the way we live. The good news of the gospel of grace has not penetrated the level of our emotions. If Siemens is right, the world is thirsty for grace. It drinks it in. It needs to drink it in. But George MacDonald doubles down on that insight when he writes, you need not be a Christian to build houses, feed the hungry, or heal the sick, important as those items might be for humanitarian good. There is only one thing the world cannot do that the church must, and that is offer grace. In former generations and former years and centuries, the most read book in the world after the Bible was Jonathan uh, Bunyan, John Bunyan's. I was thinking of Jonathan Jarbo. <laughs> 
John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, Dan prayed for uh, a, a tragedy in our world. I, I didn't write down notes about this, and there are... Um, we are all grieved by it. And I certainly don't, and I will not say anything uh, political, but... Uh, there is a consternation of causes. And surely part of the cause is that our culture has changed. That itself might be complex. Perhaps we are not, I think we are not. I'm, I'll put my weight down on that. Giving enough resources to the mentally ill in our culture, we aren't paying enough attention to the ways in which uh, media is, is removing people from relationship we are not paying enough attention to the way people are being inculcated and trained. We are, have changed as a culture. We, we had many more guns per capita in 1980 and more than that in 1940 than we have today, but the culture has changed. We no longer understand as well who we are and who we are accountable to and how we are to live together. I, when I was home in Washington, D.C., uh, several years ago, uh, Carl F. H. Henry was one of the great American evangelicals was teaching a Sunday school class. I read about it in the Washington Post. I said, I'm going to go to that. And he gave an overview of Western thought in 50 minutes. It was great. It wasn't superficial. But at the end, he said, I, here's your assignment. I want you to go home. And I want you to um, think about what the problem in the modern world is. And I sat there and I said, darn, I'm not going to be here next week. I wish I knew what he was going to say. And he broke every rule of a teacher. <laughs> He said, I'll tell you what my answer is. Now, of course, there's not one right, right answer. And this, this probably isn't the right answer. But well, it is, it is one of the many right answers. But if I had I'd written something down for a, a million years, I wouldn't have come up with this answer. He said, I think the problem with the modern world is that we no longer understand what it is to be human. Now, of course, that's related to other things. We know, understand who God is, and He's the Creator, and we stand before Him, but it's, an inter it's interesting and I think helpful to approach it that way. We don't understand our own humanity. I believe we are living in a time where there's a secular religious philosophy which is being taught. We need to return to uh, the protection of religious liberties. We are being taught that existence precedes essence. That's a fancy phrase, but I was raised in that as existentialism. We're thrown into life. We, we're here in life before life means anything. Today we're in a postmodern time, and it's changed from the individualism of existentialism to the, the social construction. Uh, who we are and our world is constructed socially, but it's the same in the sense that there is nothing out there to which we are to conform, to which we are to be. There is no essence. We create ourselves, we make ourselves, we choose ourselves. I'm shocked at how consistent contemporary ideology is to foundational philosophies. Ideas do have consequences. And one of the solutions to our way forward is the church must be the church. The church, the world needs the church. The world needs the articulation of who we are as people, created, loved by God, sacred to one another, accountable to one another, and accountable before Him. That is the good news. We need a world in which we are seeped in literature like Pilgrim's Progress. In that book... The central character, the pilgrim, whose name becomes Christian, moves from earth to heaven. He's on a pilgrimage from sin to salvation, and on the way he comes across foe and friend alike. They have a variety of names, despondency and despair and futility, and he's discouraged by some, but most people can name the name that pilgrim gains that is Christian, but very few can name what his name before was. On part of his journey, uh, in one scene, Porter asks him what his old name was. And he says, well, my name now is Christian, but my old name was Graceless. 
To be a Christian is to be grasped by grace, to have it be the foundation of all that we are and all that we have. My question is, now that Christ has come into your lives and ripped that heavy burden of sin from your back, are you living graceful lives? I have been struck by the fact that the group Jesus seems to have the most criticism and anger towards is the group he resembles most in Scripture. Many scholars agree that Jesus closely matched the profile of a Pharisee. He obeyed the Torah, the Mosaic Law, but he singled out the Pharisees for his most vivid attacks. Snakes, he called them. Brute of vipers, hypocrites, blind guides, whitewashed tombs. What provoked those outbursts? After all, the Pharisees devoted their lives to following God. They gave away an exact tithe. They obeyed every minute law in the Torah. They sent out missionaries to gain new converts against the relativists and the seculars of the first century. They adhered to traditional values. The Pharisees, in short, made model citizens. Jesus' fierce denunciation of the Pharisees show how, shows how seriously he took the threat of legalism. He says, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. Legalists have not been made new by grace. They think that we can barter with God, that we can put God in our debt, that he needs to accommodate to us because we have kept His law. We are what we should be, and so He is beholden to us rather than we beholden to Him. That's why grace is not only the foundation of the gospel, it is the foundation of the Christian life. The greatest adversary that pilgrim, that Christian meets in pilgrim's progress is legality. He writes, no man as yet was ever rid of his burden by legality, no, nor ever will be. You cannot be justified by the works of the law. Uh, Victor Hugo has written a great novel about grace. It has been made into a Broadway musical, many different versions of a movie, the last one with Hugh Jackman and Anne Hathaway. I hope you've seen it. I hope you've seen the, the Broadway play, if you could. It understands that wherever grace is offered, it's threatening. You probably, many of you remember the story, Jean Valjean is condemned unjustly, maybe justly, but over-condemned for stealing a loaf of bread as an impoverished, starving man. And when he's released, nobody will take him in. And finally, a kind bishop gives him shelter in his home, and he serves him on his finest silver, and Valjean is tortured by that, but he, he's in a comfortable bed, but he gets up and he steals the, the silver from the bishop, and he's caught the next morning by the officers of the law. He's brought back to the bishop, and to be confronted for his theft, and the bishop looks at the policeman, he looks at Valjean, and he says, well, Jean, this is my gift to you. You know that. Here are some silver candlesticks. Why didn't you take them as well? Then Victor Hugo writes, Jean Valjean opened his eyes wide and stared at the venerable bishop with an expression which no human tongue can render any account of. Jean Valjean was like a man on the point of fainting. The bishop drew near to him and said in a low voice, and I love this, Jean Valjean, This day I have bought your soul for God. Grace does that to us. It transforms us. It changes us. It is the foundation of everything, and it was for Jean Valjean. Real grace, when it is offered, is threatening. It transforms. It changes. God wants us to live in such a way that people look at us and say, you know, there's no way to explain what I see in that life. There's no way to understand except that they have been gra grasped by the grace of God. God is turning His church into display cases, into trophies, into laser light shows, into 
fireworks. He wants the world to say, I can't explain the humility and boldness. I can't explain the gentleness, yet conviction. I can't explain the moral beauty. I can't explain this person's life other than this person must have a great and glorious God. Live in accordance with that. Live graceful lives. Go away this morning and ask him, am I? Then there are two other steps. I'll be quick with them. Certainly the second step. We go from grace to faith. My very first sermon in high school as youth pastor at First Baptist Church of Washington, D.C. Uh, was on the nature of grace. I have no idea what I said, but I remember that title. I know it must have been dreadful, as if I knew anything about it, as if I know much now. I, what I've come to know is there isn't much to know. Faith isn't something that you point out. It isn't something that you revel in. Faith is transitive. It's something that starts with grace and gets you through to works. Grace is trusting in God, is referring to God, is re uh, releasing one's life to God. Grace is the kiss of a soul in the, in the sleep of death. You know what death sleep is? It's a sleep from which the person has no ability to rouse themselves. Sleeping beauty is the picture of a life without Christ that is set in a death sleep. And faith is the consciousness, the awareness that Prince Charming has just kissed you. The Bible puts that in the terms of the parable of the prodigal son, the prodigal son finally realizes his need. He turns back to his father's home, but before he can even, before he, he can even figure out what he's going to say, the, the father comes running and embraces and kisses him. That is the kiss to a soul in death sleep. Before there was a word of faith that comes out of the young man's mouth, the father kisses him. Your soul is in a death sleep, and God comes and plants his kiss for you. And it is not the kiss of death, but a kiss of life. When by His grace God kisses your soul and you begin to awaken, you need to respond. That is faith. Grace, grace awakens faith, and then faith grabs grace around the neck. At this stage of my life, I think that's all you need to know about faith, the nature of faith. Then the text moves on. Grace through faith to the work of faith, which Paul gives this fabulous picture of. It says, you are God's workmanship. The word is literally poema. You are God's artistry. You are God's poems. You are God's marble that He has chipped and chiseled away at to make something beautiful of. Christians are God's creatures. We are in the grip of a secular religion. I've already said that. Everybody in this room according to Ephesians 2, is a masterpiece that has been defaced. And through grace and then through faith, you are being restored. You are masterpieces in the making. You were meant to be God's poetry, His masterpieces. Imagine what that means. As God's poetry, you are beautiful and you are the very expression of the divine artist, God Himself. Our culture needs to hear that again and know that again. God's love for us is not a general love. In Ephesians 5, what does it say? It says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her and make her without spot or blemish. God said, I'm going to die and bleed for your splendor. I am going to turn you into something beautiful. I am the artist, you are the art. I am the painter and you are the canvas. I am the sculpture and you are the marble. You don't look like much there in the quarry, but I can see what you are meant to be. I am the artist of your life. God wants us to make us something beautiful. He wants to take our bitterness and irritability and change us. Sociologists ask whether nature or nurture define us. Clearly, it's, it's both. 
And both are the chisels and the hammers that God uses to make us into unique flowers in His garden. There are good deeds that only you can do because of your nature and your nurture, the things that you have learned, you are unique. You didn't choose much about yourselves, your height, your weight, your ethnicity. They are God's brushes with which He makes you into His poetry. If you have grace and faith, you are on the way to being His workmanship. Sin is a form of mental illness. It's a form of insanity. Insanity is a form of being out of touch with reality. And Christians know that by grace, they have been saved through faith, and certain things follow from that. If God is the sculpture and you are the marble, He might be coming at you with very large chisels. It may be that that which you think you need to have and that which you hold on to that you can't live without needs to go. And in doing that, what God is doing is turning you into something beautiful. John Stott writes, good works are indispensable to salvation, but not as its ground or nature, but as its consequence and evidence. That's what the book of James says. Look at verse 17 of the fifth chapter of Ephesians. I hope we get there, but if not, here it is. You must no longer live as the Gentiles in the futility of your thinking. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. In your anger, do not sin. Do not give the devil a foothold. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. There are deeds of compassion that only you can do uniquely because of everything that has gone into your life, its nurture and nature, every hammer of the chisel. You don't have to worry because you are His workmanship and the gifts that you have and the experiences that you have had and that the hurts that you have filled are turning into you into a unique person to do the things in the kingdom that only you can do. You know, you didn't have choice in much. You didn't choose your parents. You didn't choose who you would grow up with. You didn't choose your troubles. You didn't choose your pains. You didn't choose your height. You didn't choose your IQ. You didn't choose your race or your ethnicity. But the artist is behind it all. All these are his brushes. And they are his chisels making you into his poetry, his masterpiece. Last week, Jonathan Jarbo read us a letter from Karen Watson from Bakersfield who gave her life on the mission field in 2005. At Gateway's graduation, our president, President Orge, read a letter from one of our distant students who is a pastor in Kiev, Ukraine, who has refused to flee but is staying there in danger and in peril in order to minister humanitarian aids to others and to give them the gospel. It, it's a display case. It's amazing. In the past month, we have said goodbye to two families who, as Jonathan Jarbo said last week, has, have given all that they have here away that they might serve Christ. It climbs far from them. I admire and appreciate those models of God's great grace, but I admire as much faithful, everyday Christians that bring their families to church and worship God in the spirit of holiness and who serve youth in our youth camps and who teach in Sunday school and who serve cop coffee and who teach Sunday school and who attend Sunday school Sunday after Sunday. I admire the faithfulness of the people of God and I have seen much of it here at Pathway. God is making you into his poetry, his workmanship, his display cases. And the goal of your lives, whether you are on the mission field or at home, is for people in your workplace and, yes, in your family to look at you and say, you know, I can't, I can't explain them for, by any other way than that they have been grasped by the grace of God. The Bible says God is looking for two kinds of people, worshipers who worship Him in spirit and in truth. I love that. 
And any church I'm a part of, any church I pastor, my goal is that those two things can be said. I want it to be truthful, which means that it's biblical. It means that it teaches the truth accurately, and ideas do have consequences, but I also want it to be spirited, which is to be passionate, which means to say these ideas and this truth make a difference. I would not have any idea how to do evangelism if I could not say at the end of speaking the gospel, come with me to church on Sunday. There's a bunch of crazy people there. They are not perfect. They have plenty of blemishes, but I will say this about them, and you can see it. Their lives are different. They are making different choices. They are living differently than if they had not been grasped by grace. That's the message of this part of the text. Be grasped by grace. Live graceful lives. Let faith point you in that direction and then live it out with confidence, knowing that you are God's poetry, his masterpieces in the making. You are meant to be his display cases, his trophies in which, as clearly as we see fireworks or laser light displays, people can see the riches and graces and glory of Christ. That is yours and my vocation in this world. May we live it with faith. Father, I ask that today some people might see that as they give themselves to you completely, as they refer their lives to you, there is no choice but to be transformed and changed and to live differently. May we rise to the threat and to the challenge of being grasped by grace because it means, unlike the Pharisees, that we are no longer in control of our lives. We are no longer ours. We are out of our control and into yours. Help us to see that. Help us to see that you are the artist and that you are turning your people into your poetry, into your work of arts, into your masterpieces. Let us not resist the chisel if it is yours. Father, there are some people who still don't know what it means to be a Christian, that it is to move from being graceless to graceful to being grasped by grace. Open their eyes so that they might be conscious of you standing there, ready to give them the, your kiss of new creation and new life. Give them eyes to see that like the prodigal son, you are ready to give them your ring and robe them with your robe. May we be bold and courageous enough to receive that and live that ourselves. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.